Hello, my name is Michael Seidman. I am a board certified otorhinolaryngologist head and neck surgeon. And sorry, but that's the fancy name for an ear, nose, and throat surgeon. I understand that you are considering tonsillectomy and plus minus on the adenoids, um, but some people who will be watching this tape will be considered for adenoidectomy as well. Now, tonsils uh, and adenoids are essentially lymph tissue. And lymph tissues are very much and are lymph nodes. In our head and neck region, we have approximately just over 200 lymph nodes. So people always ask, well, if you take out the tonsils and adenoids, uh, is there any harm going to happen because of that? And usually, if you take out, essentially, there are two tonsils and one set of adenoids that's essentially taking out three lymph nodes, uh, there is no change. The lymph nodes function as a first line of defense against infections. So people have thought, well, maybe you're going to have more infections if you take them out. But actually, the reverse is oftentimes the case. So when we take out the tonsils and adenoids, typically kids have fewer infections if that is one of the indications why we are seeing you or your child today. The primary reasons for the procedure are, number one, recurrent tonsillitis. And that is typically defined as more than four and preferably up to six episodes of strep tonsillitis per year. The other primary indication is that of obstructive sleep apnea or obstructive symptoms. That is essentially stopping breathing in your sleep. By stopping breathing, what it is is a lot of kids and a lot of adults snore. So just the routine snoring is not considered a problem today. But if you snore and stop breathing, that is a concern. So it would sound something like this. If your child is doing a lot of that, that is essentially stopping breathing in your sleep and is concerning to me as a physician and a surgeon. The other lesser indications are things such as halitosis, which is the medical term for bad breath. Um, orthodontic concerns are very controversial. A lot of times the orthodontist will say, can you remove the tonsils and the adenoids? We think it is affecting the palatal growth or the growth in the back of the throat and the mouth structures. Our literature doesn't support this very well, but on occasion if I have a letter from an orthodontic surgeon who is convinced that it's going to help them in the treatment of somebody who is needing orthodontic work, I will go ahead and remove tonsils and adenoids in those situations on occasion. Um, if people get an abscess behind the tonsils, called a peritonsillar abscess, that is an indication for us to go ahead and remove the tonsils. Again, you don't have to, uh, but it would reduce the likelihood of that occurring again. The general guidelines set up by the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery are the ones that I've pretty much touched on already, the two major ones being recurrent tonsillitis and obstructive symptoms. I'd like to show you some of the anatomy that is relevant to this area. Now the first part I'd like you to see, this is just a picture of a child, and you can get an idea. The tonsils sit way in the back of the throat, and if you open your mouth, you can see them in most people who have had their tonsils. They sit back in this region here. And I don't know if you can see this ghosted in here, but this is the uvula, or the little structure that hangs down in the middle of the back of your throat. And on either side is where the tonsils sit. Now the adenoids sit straight back through the nose. At the very end of the nose, way in the back, is where they sit in an area called the nasopharynx. So the way we actually remove those is to open the mouth, I use a mirror, and look up this way directly in the back of the nose and remove them. I'd like to move over to this area of the um, diagram. And this is a close-up of the back of the mouth and the nasopharynx. Now, the mouth is open, the tongue would be down in this region here, and you can see the uvula, which is this structure here, only half of it. And here is the right tonsil. As we're looking inside, this would be the right tonsil. The left tonsil would be sitting over here someplace. Now, the adenoid tissue sits right back in this region over here. So, again, the way we work to get those out is through the mouth and then up this way. So this is where the adenoid tissue sits. And between these two structures, if they're very large, it can certainly cause some obstructive symptoms. And again, this is just a diagram to show you. Uh, this is the nose, way in the back of the nose. Right over here is where the adenoid tissue sits. The tonsils are a little bit lower, and they are in the back of the throat in this region here. Now, what are the risks and complications associated with tonsillectomy once we've decided that this needs to occur? The primary and probably the most frightening risk is that of severe bleeding. Now, nationally, this incidence is between 2 and 5 percent. That is, 2 to 5 out of 100 people have to go back to the operating room to control bleeding. 
Uh, in my experience, um, uh, I would say that it is less than 1% right now. So it is unusual, but it is certainly the most common complication of tonsillectomy. And it doesn't mean that your doctor did something wrong or something happened. It is just the most common thing. It's an area that you essentially cauterize little small blood vessels in the back of the throat. And sometimes, just like a scab of a knee, the scab can fall off the back of the throat and you may have some bleeding. Probably the second most common complication is that of infection. Um, you can get an infection in the back of the throat. It's very atypical, i.e., uh, I mean, it's very unusual. And typically, I give my patients antibiotics. There have been some studies that have shown that if you give antibiotics after tonsillectomy, it reduces the amount of bacterial growth in the throat and can actually tend to reduce the amount of pain. Rarely, you can have persistent infections. If we've done this operation for recurrent tonsillitis, if your tonsils are gone, you cannot get tonsillitis anymore, but you certainly can get some sore throats. And the tonsils that we removed are called the palatine tonsils. Those are the tonsils in the back of the throat that I've mentioned. There are also lingual tonsils, which sit on the back of your base of your tongue. And we rarely, if ever, remove those. Those are typically left alone. <clears throat> you can also have persistent snoring. Say we did this for obstructive symptoms, and we remove the tonsils and the adenoids, and your child or you may still snore. That can happen. There are many different causes of snoring. Sometimes it's a crooked inside the nose. Sometimes there's a central cause or a brain cause of those types of problems. But usually, if you have large tonsils and adenoids and we remove them, the snoring will pretty much go away. And I've had most of my parents come back and say, you know, now I have to check up on Sally or Jimmy uh, because I can't tell if they're breathing anymore. We don't hear them. Uh, but they're generally, obviously, quite pleased uh, with that. I, to me, the scariest risk of any of these procedures is um, not W-A-K-E-ing up, and I spell that if there are any children uh, watching. The likelihood of that happening is extremely low. Uh, with tonsillectomy, the risk of something like that happening can be as high as one out of 30,000, but the risks of general anesthesia are approximately five out of a million, as uh, recently noted in a Journal of the American Medical Association uh, article. There are other problems that can happen. Once you remove the tissue in the back of the throat or the nose, the adenoid tissue, remember, is way in the back of the nose, you can have some regurgitation or reflux of things. So if you've ever drinking something that's come up your nose, it may be a bit more apt to happen after that. You can also have a change in your voice quality. The voice sounds different. And oftentimes, that is the case. People say that, you know, my child sounds a little bit different. And that's because you don't have the same air resonating through the nose. You actually have more air escaping through the nose. Uh, so you have a different quality of sound uh, in that regard. Now, what are the alternatives? Well, if you have recurrent tonsillitis, the alternative is just to treat each infection as it comes or to treat with a maintenance antibiotics. That is, to put yourself on antibiotics for six to eight weeks or sometimes even longer to reduce the likelihood of infections. Then you have to be concerned about the potential risks of antibiotics, and you have to weigh the pros and cons of each. For apnea, that is, the stopping breathing episodes, there really is no good alternative except for time. Because as your child grows, typically the back of the throat grows, and then the tonsils will typically remain the same size. So respective to the back of the throat, it appears to be shrinking. And when that happens, the snoring will probably reduce. Other people have talked about things that we use for adults called CPAP. That's continuous positive airway pressure. It's a little triangular mass that goes over the nose and mouth. And most children will not tolerate, so it's not usually a reasonable uh, alternative for your child. Now, what should you expect if you decide to have this done? Typically, about a week before surgery is scheduled, the anesthesiologist or the nurse will want to see you. They may obtain some blood work from you. They'll ask you some questions. The day before surgery, everything is fine. But the night of surgery, you're not allowed to have anything to eat or drink after midnight. If it's a particularly small child that's having surgery, you may want to speak to the anesthesiologist because they may change some of those recommendations. Typically. When you arrive to the operating area, it'll, it'll be about one and a half to two hours before. They will oftentimes give the patient, the child, or you a sedative just to relax you. They will typically start an IV there. They use some numbing medicine so it's not as discomforting, but that's usually one of the scarier parts uh, for kids. But they, they do terrific, and our people here are, are excellent, so I'm not too concerned about that. Once that's all set and we're ready to go, they leave your side in the preoperative area and they come with me. We go to the operating room. And at that point, they hook on very important monitors to monitor the heart, the oxygen in the blood, and many other monitors as well. Once those are all in place, the child is then um, put to sleep with some medication, either a mask over the face or some IVs. So 
even once the time that they leave you, it's a good 10 or 15 minutes before we get started because we have to put all the monitors on. Once that occurs, I put in a special um, instrument that opens the mouth. I remove the tonsils. We've talked about, uh, not here, but there, there are issues concerning whether you should use a laser or a knife or electrocautery. And we've done some of those studies and found that actually there was a bit more pain using the laser, so we've stopped using that on a routine basis. And I use electrocautery. In the olden days, there used to be a lot of bleeding with this operation. If I get more than three or four cc's, that's a little bit about a, about a drop, um, I consider that a lot. The adenoids, there is no way to control that amount of bleeding, and oftentimes if we do the adenoids, there's a little bit more of a bleeding, but it's not usually a concern. After this procedure is done, they wake up, they're taken back to the recovery room, they're monitored intensively by the nurses, and they don't, that's the time that I actually come out and talk to you and let you know how everything went, and once the child or once your adult is waking up, they'll then let you come back and see them. What can you expect after surgery? once you've had your tonsils out. You have to know that, of course, this is not a lot of fun. The tonsils um, can be very painful to have uh, removed. It doesn't hurt while you're uh, having the operation done, but afterwards it can be very uncomfortable. Um, some kids will not want to eat or drink anything. Now, I'm not as concerned about eating as I am concerned about drinking. I've had some kids who will eat pizza the night of surgery, and I've had other kids who won't eat anything solid for two weeks. My opinion is, is it doesn't matter provided they are drinking. They must drink at least six to eight eight-ounce glasses of juice, liquid, fluid, whatever they want. They can also have pudding, they can have jello, they can have ice cream. There is some controversy about ice cream because some people feel that ice cream can actually thicken the secretions in the back of the throat and make it a little bit more difficult to swallow. What I tell my parents is that you give your child whatever they want that they feel that they can eat. The only thing I do not allow, I do not allow any sharp foods. By sharp foods, I mean no chips, pretzels, Doritos, Fritos, anything that can cause a sharp edge and scratch the back of the throat for two weeks. I also do not encourage any strenuous activity for two weeks. So no gym, no swimming, no hardcore bike riding for at least uh, two weeks after surgery. Um, Interestingly, some people right after surgery do perfectly great. They do fantastic for two or three days, and then all of a sudden they tend to spiral and not do as well. Um, I don't know if that's some of the medications that we've given them, but that sometimes happens. Some people do terrible for the first day or two, and then they rapidly uh, improve. So everybody is different. Some people not only complain of throat pain or difficulty swallowing, but they complain of terrible ear pain. And I've had some patients have no throat pain, but only ear pain after tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. And that is because the nerves in the throat actually refer pain oftentimes to the ear. So that's not an unusual uh, problem. Um, the other thing is that sometimes people feel very good right after surgery and they are outside running around a little bit more than they should in the first couple of days and then they sort of pay for it afterwards. It's, they've outdone themselves, they've done too much. Um, in general, this is a difficult procedure if you're over the age of 9 or 10. It's a little bit more difficult for most of the kids or adolescents or adults to handle it. Actually, I've never had anybody say I didn't warn them enough because I do warn my patients about this. Um, but some people fly through this like nothing happened, and other people have a little bit more of a difficult time, and everybody is different. But I'm here, and I'm available for you if there are any concerns, and I'll be glad to answer any questions that we may have um, after this tape. And I thank you for taking the time to watch this.